and welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, this is good. Uh, Michael Kahn is back to uh, talk to us about what we can do about our own liability or get out of liability trouble or get out of jail free or whatever it is that Michael does. So um, uh, Michael's, Michael's going to lead in, uh, in just a second. He's created a couple of documents that I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of and uh, we'll be able to share those with you tonight. Um, and then later on, Danielle and I are going to talk about what's been, what it's been like the first week and a half back in practice. I know many of you are waiting for that day to occur. Some of you started this week. Some, uh, and, and so we'll, we'll talk about some of our experiences, what's been working, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share that with you. So um, let's introduce first uh, Michael Kahn. Now, uh, Michael Kahn is, uh, is a great friend of mine. We've been friends for years and years and years and years and years. Um, Michael is my attorney. Michael knows dental practices, medical practices. He knows the ins and outs of what's going on. And so uh, between that and all the big cases that he, uh, that he solves for, not just for me, but I mean for real big important people. Um, um, he's the perfect guy to, uh, to uh, help us uh, through this, um, this post COVID season. So Michael, before we get into the releases, let me just ask you a question. Should I really be afraid that somebody's going to sue me if they get COVID-19? Is that, I mean, is that going to be a real concern for me? I think so. If you just look at the macro worldly uh, and you look and, and it's not getting a lot of publicity right now, but there's a lot of pending lawsuits that are based upon what's happened because of COVID. Uh, a lot of states are being sued. A lot of organizations are being sued. And Congress is trying to deal with that sort of liability. And unfortunately, we live in a terribly and overly litigious world right now. Uh, and, and, and lawyers are to blame, okay, there's no doubt about it, along with willing clients. So there's a, in this great country of ours, um, anybody can sue anybody. And they're always looking for deep pockets and anybody with a prefix of doctor, okay, let alone mister, okay, but any of that, that was an inside joke, by the way. But, you know, uh, basically, uh, anybody with a prefix of doctor is deemed to be uh, a deep pocket. So I think that is real. Uh, and especially as we begin to open up and you see more patients, which, of course, I want everybody in attendance to, to be back to work. So, uh, yes, I think the threat is real. Now, you're not an insurance guy, you're an attorney, but is... If I am sued, is this, I mean, we've never had this type of thing before. I mean, do you know if this is covered by liability policies? Is that I don't. As a matter of fact, I, I think it is not. And I think that there is evidence of insurers trying to slip coverage. So I do have some knowledge of that. It just kind of uh, came back to me when, because I've heard this from clients that they've already gone to coverage and the insurance companies are scurrying from it. So I think they're gonna fight that, insurance companies. And that's too bad, but I think that insurance companies are worried about uh, millions of lawsuits, okay, uh, and large lawsuits, and they're worried about bankrupting themselves. So I don't think it's gonna be covered. Okay, but um, I gotta check with my liability insurance carrier and find out. Absolutely. But uh, okay, so we've we're 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 back in practice. We're doing everything we can to mitigate uh, any exposure to to any virus. So we're doing what we can. Some of us have some methods. Some of us have other methods. And later on, when Danielle and I will talk, we'll talk about the methods we've chosen and why we've chosen them, and uh, you know the science will have to catch up with all that. But um, here we are. We're exposed to employees, and some employees could potentially get sick. Um, patients could potentially get sick. Um, employees could bring that home to their children and they could get sick. I mean, so we've got all of these risks that, um, that we have. So Michael came up with a document, or a couple of documents. And so let's go over those documents uh, today. Michael, anything you wanna say before I go to the documents? Uh, just briefly, what I was trying to do in these documents 
is cover the, the two areas that I think that dental practices will be vulnerable to. One is patients. Uh, and you all have had experience with, I'll say, bad or uh, rogue patients before. I mean, everybody has in business. And anybody is out to look at somewhere to get a deep pocket to pay for something. And so patients, uh, basically, I have cat, I prepared a document that I would have every patient sign um, as you open up to work, and I'll be glad to answer any questions about it. Um, and what I've tried to do there pervasively is cover and release everybody. And this is a very protective pair of documents for the dental practices. So for patients, as you will see with the document, I'm, I'm having them release, hold harmless, and covenant not to sue, just not just you as a dental practice, but I'm being protective of you as an owner, of employees, uh, of dentists, and other patients to that if a patient comes in they're assuming a risk and that they know it but it's not and, and it's a known risk this isn't something the draconian or out of the way uh, or out of the realm of possibility it's just a protection that you know they're assuming a risk of coming in a dental practice and then it's mirrored by the employee document because you also maybe have had rogue employees or employees that leave and they get sick and they're ready to blame somebody and that document is also pervasively having an employee who comes back to your employment, uh, release everybody possible, including co-employees, owners, dentists, and patients uh, from any liability, which I think is important. So it's really there by the title is, quote, avoidance of liability in a post-COVID world, end quote. You can't prevent liability, unfortunately, Lee, but you can do your best to avoid it. And that's a good segue into the document. Okay. And which one do you want first? Probably the patient one. Okay. So there's the patient document. Do you see it? I do see it. All right, good. And I guess, yeah, you can control the scrolling of it. But really, the first part of it is to define what COVID is okay and and how it is a potential risk and also it's kind of like to say that you and some of this and that's why i put the uh disclaimer on it or you have because it has to be modified to the individual dental practice of, as you've said for example in the second paragraph we're saying that the dental practice has expended significant sums of money to purchase sophisticated equipment. Well, some practices will and some practices won't. Or preventative measures, you will do what you have to do, but then it depends beyond that. So this document has to be uh, seen as um, having to be modified uh, by, you know, per particular practice. Well, now, um, let me ask you a question. I'll, I'll challenge you because you're an attorney. What the heck? Yeah, what the heck? Oh, pardon me, I'm going to do my Dunkin' Donut commercial. <laughs> that was Dunkin'. Dunkin', he said. Dunkin'. They, 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 uh, they promised me $10 every time I would hold this cup up, but I'll just do it. <laughs> I told everybody this is going to be non-commercial. Oh, gosh, I'll tell you, I've just blown the whole whole thing for you. You're so. right. All right, so let's assume that somebody copied this. Okay, because you know people would, would 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 have the tendency to do that, even though it says do not copy. All right, so what kind of risk are they at if they just take this document as is and they don't modify it for their individual situation? Well, they're at every, the best document is, and you've heard the, the expression, and it's usually used in the pejorative, quote, boilerplate, end quote. Like you can get boilerplate minutes for corporations, you could get boilerplate any agreement. And I've had, I've had in some of the ordinances I've drawn uh, for cities and counties, people get boilerplate, those that just grab it and run. But it really increases a vulnerability of the document being overturned. Because if a judge, you know, God forbid, what these documents are meant to do is dissuade litigation. That's the whole point. And so if a judge sees this and he just sees that it's just, you know, something that is boilerplate, it's more apt and to be easily challenged. So you want a document like this 
that is more meticulously crafted to put in things that are specific to your dental practice so that everyone knows that this is your practice and it's it that would make it, it increases its impervious nature to 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 challenge okay uh, you know period so yeah it's it, that's why um that you put here at my request do not use as as is all right good let's go what what else what are the important parts of the document that you want to share well, with beyond them? that if you scroll up what you're going to see up is i guess down really okay. what you're going to see is the last two paragraphs and i've tried to make something that is that is precise and to the point uh, because you don't want to hand an uh, incoming patient a five page document and expect them to sign it. Okay. But you want to make this to the point and what these, the next two paragraphs are an acknowledgement of the risk that's going to be inherent in coming to a place, you know, with more people in it and that there's uh, you know, you, that there, it's, it's a lesser control than being closeted in your home. So basically, uh, it's acknowledging the risk of it uh, in the in the in the this paragraph here, the third paragraph, and then in the last one, it's an assumption of risk, and it says certain uh, I'll say buzzwords like hold harmless and release and covenant not to sue, and it really then those um, descriptions are to prevent and release you. Uh, from being sued, and the, you know, and these are classic release. And most everybody out there in the audience, I'll guarantee you, knows or has heard of the word release. This is this is release language. And what I think the power of this document is, it's meant to give comfort to everyone. Okay, meaning that I want like your staff to know that the patients are going to be signing this. You can even tell other patients that patients are. You know, let's say there's a um, uh, somebody is reluctant to sign it, but you you can emphasize that this document is protecting them too, because you're going to have other patients that may not be as nice as them and may want to sue somebody. Well, this is this protects them. If you look at the last uh, sentence, it says, "I understand and agree that this release includes any claims, and claims are defined here, based on the actions, omissions, or negligence of the dental practice, its employees, agents, representatives." and other patients. So the idea is this document is meant to protect everybody. So the, you have several things that are congruent in this document. Uh, and that is classic release language with a pervasive um, of individuals that are protected. And so I'm kind of proud of it. Well, good. I'm proud of you too. Thank you. So let's go to the next one, and that's for Steph. Yes, and this is important, and I'm doing this, and I have basically done these agreements for a variety of different um, occupations, uh, and, and uh, from physicians uh, to dentists to also retail and different people, including daycare, okay? Um, and so each document, it has the same outline, but it has to be particularized, not just to uh, the particular and individual dental practice, but to the occupation. So that's where you start with the general framework. So the first two paragraphs are the same. And they also include just the point that you can't guarantee that anybody, an employee, will not be common infected. You can't. So it's an assumption of risk predicate. It's almost like that's the first two paragraphs. That's why there's a line dividing them. Okay. Now, as you scroll down again, it's exactly the same framework. You have the employee, and you are telling them that again, your this this release is, in a way, it's it's as protective, if not more protective, than the patient one. Okay. And what I mean by uh, describing it that way is uh, that you want to uh, promote the patient coming into the office and you want to protect other people from the patient but the employee is you, you want to provide them for protection from all angles uh, even their own negligence okay so the bottom line is 
to 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 because you've described to me, which I know you'll describe later with Danielle, which was very instructive to me, that you the way you introduced and reintroduced your staff to your dental practice, which I thought was very unique, and your and the participants tonight are going to find that very useful to them how you did it. But what you told me that was a key to what this agreement is, you told me that at the beginning, your staff was very concerned. And it's almost like you had to win them over again. And this document is helpful to you. And because you should have each one of your staff sign it because it releases, it, it tells them that, okay, they're assuming a risk by coming back because of other staff members and patients, but it shows them that they're protected and they're gonna be protected from suit by other employees and by anybody else, including patients. So it's, it's again, a document meant to protect the staff uh, with the same sort of framework that we did before, uh, where the last par the first paragraph talks about the risk and then, uh, excuse me, the third paragraph, and then the last paragraph talks about they're assuming the risk and releasing hold harmless, uh, you know, everybody. And it just gives everybody in your dental practice, patients, employees, owners, dentists, the maximum protection that they can, that they can have. And if you wanted to do this, let's say your practice, I'll make it up because I didn't do one for this, but you could have, let's say you employ 10 dentists or you have a practice that has, you know, several dentists. You could also make one up for the dentists coming in, if you see my point, because they might be um, concerned themselves. So you could have dentists sign a release as well, like this one. I'm getting Danielle right now. <laughs> so <it's super> okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Um, that's the, um, I think one of the concerns that we all have is whenever we're confronting somebody with something like this, you know, the, the possibility that somebody will say, no, I'm not signing it. So let's assume an employee said, no, I'm not signing this. What do we do? That's a great question. And the answer is kind of multifaceted. The first thing I would tell you, if you haven't, this has happened in other um, uh, um, employment and other occupations that I've used this document with. And that's a question I'm asked by owners. And what I say, what I say is several, several things. The first thing I say is that you need kind of a, uh, for the patient ones, and you need for the employees kind of a precursor time where you explain this to them, kind of like what you're gonna be telling everybody later on in this presentation, where you show them this document and describe it to them. And I've actually had prep sessions with another uh, you know, occupation using this document where I talk to the staff and if they had any questions about why I'm asking that they sign it or why their owners are, I describe it to them. What is, what is, how do they approach patients? What part? So the bottom line, hey, Danielle. So a bottom line is that basically that, that you start with um, a kind of a, a precursor session where you describe the document and what it is going to accomplish. Now, in other occupations, I have joined that as a help to do that, okay? So they could ask me any legal questions. But your question was something different. It occurs after this briefing. What happens if somebody doesn't want to sign it? That's happened, okay? That's happened already. And here's what I say. That's why I say the answer is multifaceted. The first thing is, if some a patient or an employee refuses to sign the document, that's a tap on your shoulder about that person. On one level, it's understandable. Everybody's afraid. But on, the, on another level, it's a tap on your shoulder that may be perhaps this is a potential patient that you don't want to have for other reasons in 
you know, your office or the same with an employee. So you get a chance to gauge that, you know, is that authentic? Can you talk about it? But, and then you have to judge in the very end, your risk, you have to judge it. Well then let's assume that I decided to let an employee go as a result of not signing this. Does that put me in any jeopardy, any liability there? No more or less than when I first said that, you know, anybody in this wonderful country can sue anybody. It doesn't. It's much less of a risk than anybody suing you on behalf of COVID. And I'll tell you why. Because you have an option to tell all the employees that question you and say, look, I'm doing this because I'm worried about a pandemic. It's a once, hopefully, in a lifetime event. Okay. Um, but you have to the employee a multitude of different, if you don't want to sign up here, you have a multitude of different dentists that you can be employed with. It would be, even if they brought a lawsuit about that, that's a loser. I mean, I'll, I'll I, you know, one might say I'd go out a limb, but they've got a number of different places they can work and you're just acting in the best interest of your co-employees and the patients. And that's the same with the patient, Lee. Now, someone could say, hey, look, we're just opening up. We don't want to confront patients with this. And you have a choice about that. You have two different agreements, but I think it goes back to your first question. You don't confront, if you don't require patients to do that, is that the kind of risk that you want? Mm -hmm. And there's another benefit about seeing them refuse, for lack of a better way to put it, because that indicates something inside them. It could be authentic, but it also could be a tap on the shoulder, uh, you know, like this. You know, well, I was going to do this, but I, I, oh, I lost my arm there. But that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, a tap on the shoulder. Okay, to to You've basically. You've now proven say, that's not your library. Yeah. The, <laughs> oh well, now I'm just. I thought you'd give me this great big office, but you got these things back here. What are they? Books? Is what's a? Is that a concept here? I don't know what a book is these days. But in any event, you you know, it's. I think that there is a value, not only in presenting this document but also getting the reaction from either an employee or a, uh, a patient, engaging that reaction on, on another level. Right. And obviously I have to get Danielle to sign it first. <laughs> <laughs> Better take her right. She's got symptoms. <laughs> she got <you. laughs> uh, I've got some questions. Will the documents be available? This video will be available and I'll leave it to you to uh, do um, screenshots and things like that. The documents themselves will not be available uh, to the general, uh, general, general people here. Um, yeah, that's okay. Let's see. If a patient signs the form and eventually gets infected, is that and then sues? Are we off the hook one hundred percent? You, if anybody know the answer to that, no. There's no gar that you know, and that's the documents. It's like this is a disincentive to litigation. You know, I uh, basically have spent a career, uh, you know, I'm in the enviable position is I don't need any particular client. I hate to let you in on that, Lee, but I don't, okay, you know. You mean I'm expendable? Friend. So it means well, I have to oh, sign a document no, with you? I'm saying, first of all, how did it, I get demoted from being your best friend to a close friend? We're gonna talk about <laughs> that later. <laughs> Today was a very good friend. I, I don't know what I've done, uh, but okay. But in any event, uh, the bottom line is, unfortunately, in the law, there is no guarantee. that it, There is no guarantee. But what happens is there's a preventative uh, disincentive uh, because, you know, of, of, of litigation, which is what I've provided here. Uh, somebody who's looking to sue you is going to have to take that document to a lawyer, and they're going to see that as a release, with all due modesty, it's pretty ironclad. So the answer to the question is, no, I'm sorry. I, I, it, there's nothing in the law that is 100% guarantee, but it's a disincentive to litigation, which is in, in everybody's sake. I spend about, you know, 40% of my time, uh, you know, interviewing clients uh, and then disincentivizing them even by not taking their cases or just telling them that they shouldn't litigate. 
Uh, I think it's one of the most valuable things I, I, I do in 43 years of practice, disincentivizing litigation. Yeah, from both and you, you, I think you may have done that for me once or twice. Yeah, I think I have. <laughs> um, just to, uh, for those who, who are, who are on. Um, if you want the document, then you write to me. I've got to, uh, there's something I, I, we can talk about later on. So just uh, send me an email, leadirectordentistry.com, and I'll let you know uh, how you could receive the document if you want it. Um, the um, And uh, to see this video so that you can photocopy the document or, or you, can, you can print screen the document, you can... Uh, Go to directorofdentistry.com slash learn, and it will be posted tomorrow. And you can just uh, look at the video and with no ties to anything, any organization, anything like that, to my organization or anything else. You can just look at the video. And, and th so that's the easiest, that's, 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 that's the way you can do it. If you want the individual document, just write to me. Um, are hospitals requiring this for nurses, doctors, cleaning crew, administrators, et cetera? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I, I represent a number of different physicians, a number of different dentists, a number of different lawyers, and and in retail, uh, you know, different. And those are the types of establishments that are using this. Hospitals should be requiring it. I will say that. I think anybody should. I think anybody that now, you know, I, you know, I, I have a. Uh, I guess a, uh, a, you know, I have an authorship kind of a, you know, I would say stake in it. But what I'm saying is I think hospitals should use this document. I think anybody should opening up. It's just something that should be required. As a matter of fact, it was just during this broadcast itself, it just hit me that, that those dental practices with a multitude of dentists should have, now I know you, there's gonna be something that you're gonna say, okay, I'm coming here. So. No, I'm seeing something else. Uh -oh. So the bottom line is that- <laughs> No, it has to do with best friend. And, uh -oh. and the comment is, because nobody can admit his best friend is a lawyer. <laughs> that's low. That's no, low, but that's coming good. the period out of the course. It's pretty good, that's not bad. That's not, I see what you're saying. Okay, all right, I can. I could get that one for whoever that is, uh -huh. but, that, but whoever that is doesn't get the document leave. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, so I get it. So that's, I think that uh, all hospitals should use a document. I think it's an important document. It's like uh, almost a, a rite of passage into reentry of opening up, you know, our beloved country. Okay. If a patient uh, refuses to sign, do you still treat the patient? Well, right, see, can you be sued for not treating the patient? No, you can't be sued for lack of payment as long as you're not in a practice where, you know, that you, it, it, that it's you or no one else, okay? Uh, but that's a great question. Uh, and, you know, for refusing the patient, that is your prerogative, uh, unless there's a situation like emergency treatment that you may be compelled to or else you could be sued. But uh, uh, no, and you shouldn't be afraid of that. The other flip of the coin is that if a patient refuses to sign it, as I've said, you know, I think that's a tap on your shoulder. I think everybody needs to have a screening uh, of incoming patients and employees, uh, you know, to, for indications of bad intent, for ba lack of a better way to put it. Okay, good. Is it necessary for the dentist to review each statement verbally with the patient? And with the employee, or is simply giving it to the to the party for signature enough? That's another great question. If I were a, a dentist, uh, you know, basically, I think it's a good PR opportunity. I would not just hand that document to. Now, in other occupations, including, you know, for example, there, where there's a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll I'll say for uh, for example, we represent uh, a daycare center where there's a lot of employees. There's 50 employees. Uh, you know, and then there's maybe six supervisors and there's hundreds literally of uh, incoming children. So, and so you have the parents, employees, supervisors that have to be doing this. And what we did there is we had the supervisors go over, that's, I kind of had a prep session and they went out to the employees in groups to describe it. So I would never, no matter what the group is, either dentists, uh, patients or employees, just hand, oh, somebody, I can tell by your expression, somebody else is, 
is, I'm is just reading the same one. I love okay. it. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, know I thought they were on a roll here with the with the lawyer comment. So I would not just uh, read or hand it to them. I think it's a PR opportunity to show either your employees or your patients the care that you are taking with them. You are protective of them. With so the patient can look at it a couple different ways. Hey, if I don't sign this, I may get treat and not get treated. But if you look at the document, let's say they're a patient and think of the other patients that you have. And this is the way you should describe it. You're protecting each patient against another patient suing them. Okay. Because Good. that's a part of the, the document. It's not just, hey, you know, this document is, if I do say so myself, well crafted so that you, you're protecting the patients. It's not less just that if I don't sign this, I don't get treated. Signing this means that if there's a rogue patient that wants to sue people, that that patient, if they sign that, can't sue another patient, if you see my point. I do. You yeah. see my point. Because um, somebody, somebody came in late, said, can I fire an employee for not signing? And the answer is yes. Yes. Um, okay. Some, someone else, uh, uh, did you, do you place your your name and the name of your practice where the dental practice is. And the answer is that this is a copy only and it should be customized to your practice in order to minimize your risk. Boilerplate plate documents are treated by do boiler as boilerplate plate documents by the court. And so it, if you define who you are and there are specifics on that that make it yours, then it's uh, more defensible in court. So that's, that's right. Important. Okay. That's exactly correct. Okay, what an existing point, a patient with ongoing treatment does not sign. I don't have a good answer for that. Just, well, that's, uh, that's, again, a great question. It's great questions tonight. And that is, uh, the answer to that is, in a way, you're kind of stuck. Because there you are mid-treatment, and there is a risk of liability if you stop treatment there. I mean, there is one. That's all there is to it. So the odds are, if that happens, that I would say the odds are, it depends on the, where you are in the arc of treatment, I will say that, but the odds are that that's treatment that has to be continued. But again, it goes back to the first disclaimer, Lee, that you said, you know, how each situation has to be individuated per practice. Guess what? If that happened to you and you call me on the phone, we would talk about that and we would maybe fashion a release that's different from all the rest of the releases. So you could discuss that with your patient who is an existing patient. That's an excellent question. It's true, and we're gonna talk about more about that. And actually, this is a lead into what Danielle and I are gonna talk about as well, because the um, the final, well, one, <laughs> a very good friend of mine said, also says, who's a periodontist says, be kind to lawyers, my sons are lawyers. Stay, so. <laughs> stay. All lawyers aren't bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, take it, and they're opportunists. I mean, I've, I've lifted this Dunkin' Donuts cup now six times. I mean, that's, uh, I get royalty. <laughs> right, now, the, the final comment here, no, it's not the final comment. There's additional comments here. Um, uh, let's see, you explained this well. Would it be good to show this presentation at a staff meeting as a precursor to asking my team to sign it? And the answer is, yeah. Sure. I mean, this is going to be available to you. You'll go to the website, go to directorofdentistry.com uh, slash learn. You'll see it. Copy the YouTube link so you don't have to go back to, to, to that site anymore. And then you'll have the YouTube link. You can show this whenever you want. Well, one other thing, if I, I may be so bold, I mean, basically, if there were a number of people that wanted to show something like this as a presentation, we could go a step further, Lee, and actually fashion a presentation that is for that you know what I mean just I mean it, it, I, I, I accept the compliment well explained but we could go a step further because I never thought of it that way but if it wanted to be done uh, we could do something further about that okay that's good um, this is one that comes from a well-experienced periodontist uh, and he says that uh, our malpractice and liability folks suggest we don't get a specific liability sign statement is this because they are not covered liabilities of those companies? And if not, is there insurance coverage for this? And I don't know that we know the answer to that question yet, do we? Well, you got two questions yeah. uh, right. involved there. 
let me take the first one because first one we kind of talked about this my experience post covid okay is that insurance uh, companies are scurrying for cover and they're disclaiming coverage on it okay now so i think that's part i'm suspect okay now the, the second point is i'm suspect of an insurer who said that you shouldn't get a whole harm yeah, that, 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 that's a, I, that makes a big red flag of the insurance because anything okay a piece of paper that there was an earlier question how impervious is this how strong is this and i said well it's it's, it's strong but it's not 100 percent risk-free but i can tell you this that any hold harmless does you better than no hold harmless and this is a very well crafted one so i would be suspicious of any insurer who says oh no don't get a whole harmless i i i don't know they're not, I, I don't believe that advice just go to a hospital and see all the things you sign before they operate on you. I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine. Yeah, no, it's our, no, I agree. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then I have the answer to the question, but I'll let you answer it. Um, okay. What about patients that are on periodic periodontal maintenance? In other words, they're getting their teeth cleaned every three months, every six months, and don't want to sign it. What do you do with them? Well, there's, again, another good question. Uh, it's, it's, it's a business choice. Now, if somebody's on a pair, if, if I would be again suspect of somebody who's coming in repetitively, you, you know you're going to see, okay, and that isn't willing to sign that because on the business side, hey, you're giving up a piece of income that's recurring, okay. But then the more, let's say if you have one uh, periodontal, uh, you know, session that's necessitous or several, and then they're gone, as opposed to somebody who's coming in a lot, if you don't have them sign and you know that they're going to be coming in, you know, every six months, every three months, et cetera, then every time they come in and they haven't signed, there's your risk. Okay. So that's the balance. Yeah. You know, I would be fearful of, you know, having a, a, a patient enter uh, and, and not sign if you know that they are going to be a recurring patient. That would bother me. Okay. That is the questions. But Michael, I want you to stay on as Danielle and I talk, because you, you know the mechanics of our practice, so you might be able to comment on that. Do you mind staying with us? Not at all, because that'll give me more chances to uh, <laughs> do my Dunkin' Donuts uh, thing. You know, and I just, Dunkin' Donuts coffee gives me the jitters. So don't, don't try to countervail my uh, my royalty. <laughs> the sponsors. Uh, that, that, you've just defined why maybe you're my close friend, and not my best friend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, final, there's another question. Does the patient or the staff have to sign it more than once? So let's assume that somebody's on periodic maintenance. They have to sign it all the time or is one, one, one signature enough? Again, a, a very good question. And the answer is I would take this. It goes back to your point about individuating the document. If there is a uh, patient that is on a frequent uh, care or consistent care, I would make that document uh, a subset. In other words, I would particularize the document to cover that. And there are other things that I would say, you know, that I may particularize documents depending on what the treatment are. So you might have different, uh, you know, types of documents. I'm not talking about an infinity of them, but I'm talking about several. And let me tell you the power of doing that. If it were ever challenged, okay, God forbid that you, anybody would have to, you could show the care that you took with individuating, not just for your dental practice, but within your patients. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I would think that that would be something that would actually strengthen any and all, because that would be testimony as to what the care that you took to make sure that every situation potential is covered. Okay, that's good, Michael, thank you. So, um, great presentation, thank you. Oh, thank you, great my document. pleasure, guys, really, my pleasure. So as we're getting uh, now, for those of you, I guess most of you know that we're in Florida. So we're in Florida. We opened up, uh, we were able to open up um, a week ago Monday. So it was May 5th. Is that the May 5th, May 4th, something like that? May 4th, yes. Okay. So we're able to do that. And we chose not to do that. So I want to go over the sequence of events. Um, and I hope you don't find it boring, but I, I think it's instructional. So you'll understand what we did in order to be able to pave the road successfully to opening up the practice to what was booming results. 30 new patients called last week, our first week. <coughs> Monday, 16 new patients called. That's what can occur as a result of some of the things that 
that we're about to talk about. So, Danielle, when we first knew we were coming back, and we only found out on Thursday evening, like April 30th, like after 5 p.m., that we'd be able, able to open the following Monday. It was a Wednesday evening. Oh, Wednesday I remember evening. it clearly. <laughs> Yeah, it was a Wednesday evening, and we were going to come back Thursday and Friday. And I think when you first got the news, of course, we we're just let's just open them up, let's just get going, let's just see patients, and and then we started to think about all the things that we needed and the things that we didn't get to do because we didn't have the luxury of some of these offices that have a few weeks to to get ready. Um, that we decided, okay, we we have some things to order, we we have some things to plan, we have some things to educate because we're not ready and we have to make sure that we look good in front of our patients because if we're running around asking questions, do we take their temperature? What do we ask them again? Do I, do I bring it back? Do you bring it back? What do we do? We couldn't do that in front of the patients because um, they're, they're, they're really wanting us to be in control and, and I'm answering the phones and, I'm, and they're coming in and they have a look on their face and their question is, what are you guys doing? And when they walk in and see what we've done or they hear what we're doing on the phone, they're completely okay with coming in. And they're also saying, thank you very much for doing this. So I am so glad that we took that time to do it because you see the mask starting to come off. You see them starting to relax and, and then they're ready to come in. But if we wouldn't have prepared went like we did, we, I think we would have had a lot of upset patients, a lot of people talking about how we are not prepared or putting them into danger. I think it would have really hurt us. And instead, it's really helped us. We have an overwhelming amount of patients wanting to come in, accept treatments and go forward. So it really did help us. And not only that, but I think a lot of the things that we had feared is we're working with two less employees and we're doing just fine. We're, we're not slower by any means. Uh, we, we have two more washers and we have another washer and dryer in addition doing double, triple the amount of laundry and it's working. We're doing it okay. We have so many different uh, equipment like the sentry unit that we're using, the check sheets, the questionnaires, the temperature taking. We're doing all this stuff and we're running the same schedule. Hygienists don't have any extra time. We're not seeing less patients. We were able to practice it, drill it, and run it so that when we did open our doors, we didn't do it with a decreased amount of patients. You know, all of that's important. I'm, I'm getting up some of the items that we use because um, I think it's important. So um, I'll, uh, you can still see me on the screen, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's talk about sequencing because we talk a lot in in uh, about sequencing and how important sequencing and programming is that we need to do things step by step. So we find out on we we find out and then we know we're going to come back to work on Monday. The the uh, governor says we can come back to work on Monday. So what's the first thing we want to do? We want to make sure that the staff is the staff is protected. The staff feels protected. Um, so I spent a good part of Saturday and then all day Sunday putting together a PowerPoint of CDC documents, of uh, documents that show the, the differences or actually similarities between level three masks and, um, and N95 masks in terms of their risk, uh, putting together a, um, uh, well, within the PowerPoint, the number of different items that we're using, including the rinses that we're using, the vacuum device we're using, what we put into our HVAC, all of those things were put together in a sequence so that the fearful patient, uh, fearful staff members, and there were some, as Danielle said, are getting a full education, including going to the medical literature if necessary, to show that in fact, we're doing everything we can to protect them. It's more important, and I'm talking about here, it's more important to think about your staff than it is to think about your patients. Now, I'm saying we're not thinking about our patients? No, of course not but the staff is there in that environment for eight or nine hours a day. If they feel protected, then it's very easy for that protection to be translated to the patients. And so while it's nice for the patients to know, and they do need to know, um, in fact, the staff needs to be convinced. And by the way, if the staff has questions, we better not just shrug it off. We better, in fact, have the answers to those questions, or if we don't have the answers to the questions, 
will go to a good source to get the answers to questions and give those answers back. It's important. I've had, we have one hygienist who's very well involved in the American Dental Hygiene Association. She has some questions because the president of the American Dental Hygienist Association said we shouldn't be going back to work until September. That's what she wrote in a public document. That, you know, it's too risky. We don't have enough PPE and all this kind of stuff. So I had to be prepared for her. I had to be prepared for somebody who walked in, two people walked in wearing a mask because of their concerns. Um, so all of those things uh, needed to be done. So once we had that lecture in place, by that time, we had started to develop the protocols, the different protocols we're gonna have. What are we gonna use for rinses? What are we gonna use for PPE? How do we put on the PPE and take off the PPE? What's our policy going to be with regard to gowns? You know, there, there are, uh, I forgot who said, we can wear the same gown all day. Well, if I'm really concerned about cross-contamination after an aerosol procedure, do I, want to, do I want to be a patient having a dirty gown and somebody's treating me? That didn't make sense. So yeah, we bought an extra washing machine, an extra dryer, and we have the home clothes and we have the work clothes and we have the gowns which cover the work clothes. The work clothes stay here and I'm in my office right now. Um, and the home clothes are, you know, people change out of their home clothes. They change back into their home clothes when they go out for lunch and they change back into their, into their, um, um, their office uh, scrubs and, and the like uh, once, uh, when, once they're back in the office. Strict protocols, strict protocols. And so by doing that, you're setting a pattern and setting a tone for your staff and setting a pattern and stay is setting a tone for your patients. So the patients are saying something like, I knew that you would do the right thing. Hmm. How many times do we hear that, Danielle? I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's nice to hear it. And it's because we worked really hard to do that. And I and and we went over way over the, more than what we had to. And, and I think it really paid off if we didn't do that. There, I'm telling you, there were some patients that came in and they were just waiting to see us to do something wrong so they could say something. I had two of them today. They were just waiting and they couldn't. And they were, and they just said, well, it's good. It's, this is more than I got at my doctor's office. So it's, and no one's upset about it. No one's complaining about it. We got our system down packed. Uh, we have one receptionist that's running out to the parking lot to get everybody checked in and, and the patients really are appreciative. They're calling when they get there, we're running out, we're getting them in three in the, the reception room, three outside waiting um, and others in the car if they want, but we've, but we're moving them through fast. So we really, there's not really much of a time that we have more than um, three needed to be in, in the reception room. We're, they're, they're doing a great job, but we haven't had to see anything less. It's that's what has impressed me the most is, I thought for sure we would have to see a decreased schedule to make this happen, and, and we haven't. It's just practicing the protocols you put into place and drilling them until we got them right, and we got it. We're, we're doing it just the way we were before. Let me show you an example of, um, of something we sent out. So I use constant contact um, for, uh, for the office. And so essentially we had our first week back a few paragraphs, and then it was the pictures. You know, people get a lot of emails. And frankly, we've, we just found out that videos don't get watched nearly as much or don't get open nearly as much as these simple photographs. And by sending this out to everybody on our patient list, we as soon as I sent this out, it was like it was a signal for the phone to ring. When I, I think I, I sent this out, what I, it was a Sunday night or Monday morning? It, it was really early, and all of a sudden the phone is ringing off the hook. Now, could be coincidence, maybe not. But uh, there's our over-the-head unit. That's the sentry uh, sentry air unit that we're using in each operatory. This is the um, the uh, Reem Halo. Uh, uh, ionized hydrogen peroxide unit that's being placed in each of our two uh, uh, duct systems. Um, and then technology and people look at it, it, just that. And then the final picture, which is what we're here for. So um, 
a little thing like that, just taking some pictures and taking pictures of your staff and showing people what you're doing um, can, can make a tremendous difference. So we could open up on Monday. We had that staff meeting on Monday. And then what do you think we, we did on Monday? We were training. There were a lot of new protocols to put in. You know, washing clothes. Okay, everybody washes clothes every day. Well, we have to have a washing clothes schedule. And people had to know how to use the new washer. And we had a glitch on, on using, using the new washer. Um, how are we going to rinse? What are we going to rinse with? What protect, personal protective equipment are we going to use? Where's the dirty stuff going to go? Where's the clean stuff going to go? You think it's little stuff. But when you're working with the staff, everything is everything new. You know, generally, in, in, even in a small office, you put in one system at a time. We're, we're, we're putting in six or seven systems right away. The staff has to be feel comfortable with the systems. And so we were drilling those systems for the next two days, Monday, Tuesday, while staff is figuring out what they're going to do with their kids. And we're hiring a preschool teacher to come in and, and all of the things that we need to do in order to be able to make everyone comfortable. We didn't see our first patient until Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we ran a soft schedule, a 50% schedule. Thursday was about a 50% schedule. Friday was a 50% schedule. Now you're saying, wait, that's lost income. I could have made more. You know, the answer is we were able to find out over a period of time through this training, as Danielle said, that the operatory turnover was exactly the same time. No additional time. The glitches that can occur whenever a new system uh, is put in were ironed out. And so by the time we come back to, came back to work two days ago, it was pretty darn smooth. Yeah, and there was a question on there about the PPE fee. Now, we we spent a lot of money getting ready for this as well. So there's staff time for training with no revenue coming in, all the gowns, all the extra masks, cases and cases of masks, um, the, the sentry air units, and, and, and so on. Uh, so a lot of money was spent. And yes, we are charging our patients a PPE fee. We're charging... $12 per appointment, so $12 for every hygiene appointment that comes in, $12 for every treatment that we're doing. So if I'm presenting a case that has an estimated amount of about six appointments for them to come back, I'm doing $12 times six on the financial form. Patients are seeing this, and I've been at the front desk since the day we opened back up last week, and not one patient has negatively said something about it not not one and like i said i'm up there and i and i can hear when a patient complains about a two dollar increase per year for a cleaning appointment no patient has said anything about the twelve dollars important so now, it, now if if you know we do both restorative dentistry and perio in our office so if somebody's in for trying an appointment no we're not charging the twelve dollars for that we're charging yeah, twelve dollars when Correct. aerosols are going to be reduced that's and do I, that's an arbitrary fee. I don't even know if that's the right number. I just said, charge $12. Okay, right. then we'll find out how much we won or how much we lost. But I got to tell you, with, uh, what, 50 some odd patients, over new patients over the past two weeks. Um, and by the way, you publish everything you're doing on your website. Make sure everybody knows what you're doing. You're not emphasizing the disease. You're emphasizing the safety how good an environment it is. Those are the things that will, you know, that will make a difference and that, that, that do pay dividends. Those people who you're training, you're not just training your staff to do it. You're also training your staff on what to say on the phone when, when the questions are asked. So there needs to be a question and answer list and you need to come up with those questions and let your staff come up with the questions that they may be asked. And then you keep on adding to that list, keep on adding to that list, so that everybody knows what the right answer is, or at least knows what your answer is, and everybody's giving the same answer. You do that, um, I, I hope it happens for you as it did for us. It can be a very, very, very smooth um, and, uh, and, and productive, uh, productive opening. So for those of you who are preparing for it to happen in June and, and perhaps even later or maybe even next week, yeah, it can be done, and it can be done really, really successfully. What else? Anything else that we covered? There's some more questions. Hang on. There's a couple couple questions. Michael, we're even getting questions today. Oh, dear. Well, I'm glad to hear that. 
<laughs> okay. Um, someone asked which Century Air System model did, I, uh, did we purchase? We purchased the EM300 and um, we got it with a black hose, not with a white hose. And that was by accident. And I'm glad Thank we goodness. did. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And by the way, if you're using one of those uh, HEPA filter systems, remember water is going into that. You're using it to absorb water vapor. That's not what HEPA filters usually do. They're the, there to clean the air. So make sure you're where you're running that HEPA filter all night and you're running it all weekend, just like you would a HEPA filter at your house. Because not only do you want it to filter the air, which will be great, but you're also drying out the HEPA filter so you don't get mold and mildew. So just keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Um, what do you do with a PPE charge for Delta Dental when you can't charge a patient? What is it hide by Delta? Um, Brian, what can I say? We're in a very fortunate position. We don't take dental insurance. And so I, I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, are we using surgical masks for hygiene or N95 or KN95? The answer we're using KN95 for hygiene. And the KN95 are being covered by cheap disposable masks over them in order to be able to keep the KN95s clean. Um, the KN95s we originally bought cost uh, $5 a piece. Uh, Benko came out with one this week that's down to $3 or $3.50. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as more of these are being manufactured, the price is going to go down. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Thank you for your very val val valuable presentation. That's I'm sure to you, Michael. Couldn't be. Couldn't be me. Maybe it's Danielle. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I'm having a hard time with my staff. They don't want to come back. I'm talking about risk of exposure, and they're anxious. And that's uh, out in Los Angeles. And there's a couple of answers to that. Number one, um, first of all. People are going to be reluctant, and I think the quality of the lecture that, uh, that, that you give is going to make a difference. And it may be that you give a PowerPoint presentation online first. You do a Zoom meeting just like this and prepare it really well to answer the common questions to show, to show your staff uh, what you're doing. Communication makes a big difference with, with patients, too. You're sending emails um, once a week, once every 10 days, updating them as to whatever, what we're doing or what changes we've made or, you know, whatever, whatever right. concerns lightly we talk about and that, that made, made a big difference. Right. But the other thing is that staff don't want to come back because very often in some areas the staff is making more money on unemployment than they are working in your office, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's what happened. But that's only temporary. It's not going to last much longer. And I do think the communication does, does help. During the time that we were closed, I kept, almost daily communication with the staff just to see what they were doing and just to kind of give them information on what we're doing. And we, we did try to get everybody together for, for a meeting um, just to talk about mostly some of the, the lead girls. Um, but I kept communications with them just to let them know what we were doing along the way, which helped ease them and also helped keep them somewhat in the practice, even though they were home with their kids or doing whatever they're doing. So it's, when your your team is used to working every day, 40 hours for years and years, and all of a sudden they're out for four weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, their mind just goes to a different mode. I mean, I did that too. And I've been running the practice for how many years? You know, I'm home with my kids. We're, we're, we're having to homeschool them. And then you're getting into your projects. And then you really get in that mode and you start thinking, how am I ever going to be able to work 40 hours again? I can't do it. My life's too busy. So it's, and they're getting paid for it. So it's a different mode. So I would really say just, Start putting together some of those Zoom meetings for your team, just 30 minutes or so, and talk about what kind of questions do you guys have? What do you guys think? Just get them involved and let them know what you're doing so they can get in, reintroduced back into the practice again and, and actually miss it and, and want it and feel comfortable and ready because it's. I think a lot of it is just the unknown that worries them more than anything else. It is. And, of course, once you go, go back, you're back. Uh, yeah. Unemployment ends when you say right. come back and uh, talk to talk to your attorney. But um, essentially, you send a letter to those people who say they're not going to come back, saying we're back. And yeah. if they say they're not back, you know, is it, or they don't reply, then that's tantamount to to resignation. Now, different uh, different different uh, states may be a little bit different on that. So check with your attorney, employment right. attorney, make sure. 
that uh, that it's okay. But um, anyway, no, I don't uh, know the legalities with the PPP loan that people are getting as well. I mean, can they legally give their staffs incentives for coming back, like a like something great to look forward to? You know, we're gonna hire everybody back or hire phased employees back and and call it hazard pay or call it something. I mean, can they can they legally give them something as like a bonus for coming back to get them excited about coming back? Yeah, generally the PPP loan that we're getting, particularly when you have to use seventy five percent of it uh, for for employees, it may there may be a little bit of a cushion there where you can. Uh, you have to be careful of that one, Lee. You What's that? Okay. Be, you have to be careful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, it, what I'm saying is, is they are really auditing those, believe it or not, very carefully about. Uh, you know, bonuses are not included, and so you have to be very, very careful about what you're characterizing when you uh, when you okay. hazard pay. Yeah, hazard pay. Well, that's hazard that's pay. At least, at least we got from from our um, our payroll pe people. Hazard pay works. Bonuses not. Okay. Yeah. So we'll. Well, see. that's a great incentive to get them to come back to work again. So it's just seeing what you can do to get them to come back because. It is going to take a little dangling of a carrot to get them back in there again. The question is, uh, are there any issues using the ultrasonic? And we are we are using ultrasonics, and we are using everything we 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 have not uh, restricted at all. And the comment that I'm getting from um, from from the clinical um, people is the stuff that would end up on the chin. I mean, the water is being sucked up by the vacuum, and so. We're feeling pretty good about it that, uh, can I prove it? No, but certainly the clinical indications are that the water is going up into the um, uh, into the system. And frankly, we can't do a good job without cavitrons. We just can't do it. So we, we, we're we feeling good about it, but you know that's, uh, that's uh, an individual decision. Somebody asked, where did I get the EM300 from? That's Sentry Air, S-E-N-T-R-Y Air. Um, they uh, do all sorts of filtration. Um, they're very early on in dental. They've, uh, I think we bought their third dental unit or maybe the fourth one. Um, we're essentially taking a medical unit, using it as a dental unit. We are thrilled with the product. We are thrilled with the uh, ability to use it, to position it eight inches from, from, uh, from the patient. And the, and the vapor is just getting sucked up. Every once in a while, it sucks up a bit, you know, but uh, <laughs> we have to hold it nine inches away. But it's, it's, uh, it's really... It's really doing very well. Um, are we having any success acquiring disposable gowns? When we um, tried to purchase disposable gowns, we couldn't get any. And so we did not use disposable gowns. Instead, we got washable gowns. And um, so far, those are, those are doing uh, quite well. Um, can we get a copy of the mail piece you sent out with the pictures? Steve. You got one, but I'll send it to you again. <laughs> so yes, um, does consent need to be signed by the patient every time the patient is in the practice for post ops? Uh, we answered that. The answer is the more consents you get, the better. Um, one thing let me interrupt there is if you have a patient that can be customized again, uh, depending on how frequent the patient comes in. But generally speaking, what you're talking about it depends on what the patient's being treated for. And you'll customize that agreement to, to match that. And that, again, strengthens the agreement. Okay. Next one is the webinar this morning from the American Academy of Periodontology said you can give staff bonuses. So I'm a little confused. We're all a little bit confused. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when an employee cannot return because of being immunocompromised or they have to stay home to watch children, do we still have to pay them with PSLA or FMLA? And the answer is, I don't know. I know we did early on. I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so I can't, I can't, I can't tell you. I think it's something you need to check with. Your accountant will be a better source than mm -hmm. I will on that. Um, thanks for your time. What do you think of the, about the UVC unit? Um, <clears throat> I think the UVC unit has its application, but I am not an expert on this stuff. My understanding is that with the UVC unit, that uh, the UV light has to be in contact with the virus for four hours to kill it. So I don't know how it fits in. We are putting a UV component into our HVAC system, but that is not the same as the UVC unit where you have direct ultraviolet light to the uh, to the countertops, which I think is what the UVC unit is. So um, I can't, 
I wouldn't trust my opinion. So I, I'll leave it at that. Anything else, folks? We've run out of questions, I believe. Okay, listen, it's going to be good. Trust me, it's going to be good. Um, don't trust me, trust yourself, but do all of the steps. Don't think you can just go back and do it. We, we've got to be as structured as we possibly can. Um, people react very favorably to, for, to structure. You know, and we're not talking about military structure, but we are talk about, talking about sequencing, running the business as much like a business as you can and covering every base with your, with your, um, with your staff and with your patients. And I think it's going to go just fine. Understand we're in Florida and we're in central Florida. We didn't have the same things going on that, that uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, New Orleans did. So understand that the attitudes might be a little bit different. That only means that we have a little bit more work to prepare our people but to come back to work. But then again, you're going to have that time because by the time you go back to work, things are going to be a little bit more confident. You're going back to work a month from now, you'll be, your area will be more confident to go back to work, just like ours is right now. So do the work. If we can help you, contact me. If anybody wants more, more, more wants this video, directorofdentistry.com slash learn if you want to write to me you all have my email address the ap or anyplace else um lee at director at dentistry.com director of dentistry.com um and just write and i'll be happy to answer whatever questions i can danielle michael thank you very much for doing this for everybody because we've been getting some of these questions through email so this answers a lot of questions Good luck, everybody, on your start back. If you have any questions, like you said, let us know because we have been there, we have done it, and it's going very well for us. Yeah. Thanks, folks. We'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Thank you.